2 Corinthians 4, 8 says, So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. Colossians 3, 1 to 2 says, Since then you have been raised with Christ. Set your heart on things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on earthly things. And so no matter what the circumstance or what may be going on around you, fix your gaze on Jesus. Lock eyes with him and don't look away because this world is fading so fast and we should invest in things that last for eternity like love and worship and your relationship with Jesus. And so, so how many of you guys have seen Narnia, the, the Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, of that movie? Yeah. yeah? So you know how there's like mystical creatures? And when we think about those, we're like, oh, like that's obviously like fake. We've never seen that in real life. But in Revelation, we see like the four living creatures and just like, I love how creative God is because it's like we think that these are like fake, but it's like they're actually are mystical creatures, like they're actually real. And so I just want us to, if we can all just close our eyes for a few moments, and I'm going to give like glimpses of the throne room, and I just want you to imagine and picture this the best that you can. And then I'll let you know when to open. Seated in majesty on the throne is the God of love. He himself is love, our heavenly father. At his right is our King Jesus, our best friend, the champion of heaven, the beautiful man who gave his life for us so that we could be washed clean and made holy. The name above every other name, the only name that has power to break chains, to heal, to restore, to redeem, to make whole, to forgive. Just the mention of his name brings hope, peace, joy, love. Just the whisper of his name changes the atmosphere. Around this throne is a storm with flashes of lightning and roaring thunder. And this is happening right now in real time. In front of the throne, there's a sea of glass that's mingled with fire. Just imagine that. 24 elders around the throne worshiping and laying down their crowns. Four living creatures covered with eyes all around in front and in back and with six wings and four faces, worshiping God nonstop about his holiness. Seven golden lampstands. And let's gaze at Jesus, our bridegroom, who has eyes like blazing fire burning with passion and love for you. His hair is white like wool, white as snow. He's a voice like rushing water, like a powerful waterfall. And John, who is Jesus' disciple, he would consider Jesus and himself to be best friends. He knew the color of Jesus' eyes, his scent, the sound of his laugh, the way he smiled. He knew him on a deep level. They were close friends. And when he sees Jesus like this in all of his glory, he says, I fell at his feet as though dead. And I feel like we can see the beauty and the majesty of Jesus by the awe and reverence and wonder and holy fear of John in this moment and encounter that he had in Revelation 1. So you guys can open your eyes now. 
So it's so cool. Ephesians 2.6 says, God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. And he's such a kind, loving God that he not only lives in the heavenly realms, but he seats us there with him. Hebrews 4.16 says, Let us approach God's throne of grace with confidence. So as his children, he wants us to approach this beautiful, majestic throne that we just described with boldness, knowing that we have full access to our Heavenly Father. And so I was reading a book about Islam, and I honestly didn't know too much about it, but it's wild, like, just the religious duties, the pilgrimage, the running and call to prayer five times, and denying Jesus as God, and just hoping that they make it to paradise. They devote their whole lives and base every day around their religion. Devotion to a God who can't see, who can't love, who can't hear, who can't know them. Because he's not capable, he's fake, he's made up. But I'm so thankful that I can have full confidence in Jesus. And as Christians, we serve the one true living God. He sees us, he knows us, he loves us, he hears us. And so how much more should we devote our whole lives to Jesus? Every moment of the day, we should spend with Jesus. It's a privilege. And life is so much more exciting with Jesus. And heaven is not our reward. Jesus is our reward. He's our prize, our treasure. And we get the privilege of cultivating a relationship with him now before we even get to heaven. And then it continues on throughout all of eternity. And so God created us to worship, worship, and he's enthroned on our praises. And so as we draw closer to Jesus, we draw further away from the things of this world. And as we give Jesus our battles, he fights them for us. As we gaze at him, our, our problems start to fade away in light of Jesus. And so one thing that I love about the Bible, and there's a lot of things that I love about the Bible, but besides the fact that it's history and shows us how to live and thrive and be transformed. But I love that it's a story. And it tells us how things are going to end. And there's a happy ending for us. And so, I don't know about you guys, but for me, when I watch a movie, I need there to be a happy ending. <laughs> like, if there's not a happy ending, I, I don't even want to watch it. And I'm just like, why would someone make a movie without a happy ending? <laughs> but that's how I feel. And so, so, we rule and reign with Jesus forever, for all of eternity. That sounds like a pretty happy ending to me. And so no matter what mountain or valley you're on right now, we have a happy ending that's awaiting us. And God is so kind to tell us how it all plays out and that we're victorious and that we're not only citizens of heaven, but we're actually kings and queens in his kingdom. And so we should set our mind on things above and what's in store for us. Because knowing the end and that we already won, that should change how we live today in the present from a place of victory. And so I love this quote. It says, think about eternity. We will not be sharing the gospel with others in heaven. Everyone already knows the story. 
Everyone already has a relationship with Jesus. Instead, we will worship the Lord for all of eternity. Worship is eternal. So as we worship today, we are not only glorifying God, we are training for our eternal occupation. And so the second thing that I felt on my heart to share today was having a childlike mindset. And so when I think, so the verse that came to mind was Matthew 18, 3, and it says, truly I tell you, unless you change and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. And then he goes on to talk about humbling ourselves and taking um, the lowly position of a child, whoever does that is greatest in his kingdom. And so when I think about children, like, I think they, they have, like, no shame. They speak whatever is on their mind, and they speak what they believe to be the truth. And so in the same way, like, we should speak unashamed. Like, we should be unashamed to proclaim the gospel. We should speak our truth without, like, even thinking twice. And I also think about their radical faith and their trust and assurance in their parents. Because they, they don't have to worry about anything because they know that their parents have it all under control, that their parents have their back. And so in the same way, how much more faithful is our Heavenly Father, is God? And Exodus 14, 13 to 14 says, Do not be afraid. The Lord will fight for you. You need only be still. And so like children, we're helpless on our own. But with God, we have all the strength that we need. And so I don't know if you know, but God has a pretty awesome track record of miracles and of coming through and of showing up. And seeing the past, it increases our confidence and our hope and our trust in the present and in the future. And the Bible is full of miracles from cover to cover. And so if you want to increase your faith, read the Bible. And in the Bible, we see so many different names of God. We see Jehovah Jireh, Jehovah Rapha, Yahweh, El Roy, El Shaddai, Elohim, Abba, like, etc. And we see him as our healer, our comforter, provider, redeemer, source, salvation, true love, bridegroom, protector, our life, everything, sustainer, shepherd, refuge, fortress, counselor, waymaker, defender, and the list just goes on and on and on. But each name, it shows a different aspect of his character, of his nature. It shows who he really is. And so we see him as a fierce, roaring lion and as a gentle, humble lamb. There's so many different aspects and different angles. And so just like if we're looking at like a diamond and we're like, wow, it's so beautiful. But then we see it from another angle and we're like, wow, it's even more beautiful. And it's like, that's how we should see Jesus. Like there's so many different perspectives of him and each one is like mesmerizing. And that should leave us in awe and wonder and reverence of him because there's so many different depths of his love, of his goodness how he's our heavenly father, and like so many different perspectives that we've never even seen before yet. And so we should want to see him more rightly for who he is, because there's always more. And his beauty is never ending. And so like children, we should confidently put our faith, our hope, our trust, and our assurance in our heavenly father. And 1 John 3, 1 says, See what great love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called children of God. And I just want to close with this. One quote that I love, one of my favorite, probably my favorite quotes, um, but it says, This is the only time, so this being our whole life here on earth, this is the only time in history when I get to fight for God 
This is the only part of my eternal story when I'm actually in the battle. Once I die, I'll be in celebration mode in a glorified body in a whole different set of circumstances. But this is my limited window of opportunity. I'm going to fight the good fight for all I'm worth. And so I just want to encourage you guys like, to chase after Jesus with all of your heart and to live for eternity starting now for the white part of the rope because he's so worth it. Amen. And so I feel like we're supposed to just do two things. And so I'll just read these two um, verses. So the first one, the first thing, like I feel like we're just supposed to praise him and thank him just for all of his goodness, all that he's blessed us with. And it says, Psalm 104 says, enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. And so that's how we enter into the throne room, by praising him, by thanking him. And James 1.17 says, every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of heavenly light. And so if we can just praise and thank him for all that he's blessed us with. And then the second one is whatever mountain is in front of you, if you have any mountains in front of you, I just want us to ask God for his perspective on the mountain. Because when we see from his perspective, when we see from a place of victory, it changes our whole perspective. And we're not fearful. We're not afraid. And we have that confidence in him because he's so much bigger than any mountain. And so, yeah, we can just do those two things. And yeah. <laughs> Thank you.